Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. I see most people have signed in. So welcome everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to today's session. Um, how to use charge data as a competitive advantage in 2021. Uh, so just a couple of items before we get started. Uh, we do have 45 minutes scheduled today and we would like to take some questions at the end of the session. So if you do think of any, go ahead and enter those in your questions tab in your uh, GoToWebinar panel, and we will um, be happy to take those with Greg and Tara at the end of today's session. Um, another thing that I would like to point out is that we will be doing some in-session offers for some of our attendees today. So you might see your chat bubble light up an orange or a red color. Uh, so be aware of that and make sure to, to pull up that offer. And if it's something you're interested in, go ahead and reply and we'll get that set up for you. So let's go ahead and do some introductions. Um, my name is Brad Josephson. I'm the Director of Marketing here at PMMC. Um, also with me today is Greg Kay, Senior Vice President of Revenue Strategy at PMMC. Uh, Greg has 30 years of experience in healthcare uh, related to contract management and strategic pricing. So Greg, thank you for being here today with us. Thanks, Fred. Uh, also with me today is Tara Bogart, Vice President of Revenue Strategy with PMMC. Uh, Tara has 18 years of experience uh, working with hospitals related to today's topic of charge master and price transparency. So Tara, thank you for joining us today as well. Thanks, Brad. Um, thanks for the introduction. One quick question before we get started. Where is your ugly Christmas sweater? You and Greg let me down. <laughs> I know, I know, I forgot it. <laughs> well, I appreciate you organizing this today, um, Brad. Um, beyond my background that Brad provided with the introduction, PMMC is a privately held revenue cycle firm that focuses on accurate contractual reimbursement calculations um, over 30 years. And we've leveraged this data for payer analytics, perspective, contract modeling, patient estimates, strategic pricing, and over the past year, price transparency preparation. Yeah, right you are, Taryn. Um, I think more importantly, um, PMMC's team's not just focused on the preparation but also how we can help our clients actually leverage our calculation engine and the new standard charge file data, along with the quarterly CMS standard analytic files to really have a better handle on market pricing. And, and by that, I mean both leveraging all components of new pricing data, including the gross charges, the self pay cash price that will be posted soon, and the negotiated charge by payer and plan um, again, that will be posted by each hospital after January 1st. That's right, Greg. Many of you on the call today understand PMMC approaches price transparency as not just a single step, but a true integrated revenue cycle process. The integrated approach moves to eliminate operational silos between managed care and uh, patient accounting and patient engagement and your charge master maintenance. Um, so we refer to this approach as the revenue maturity matrix. Um, accurate contractual calculations have to drive full and complete collection of your contractual reimbursement. So this baseline contract governance is the starting point for creating the needed CMS files, negotiating future payer contracts, payment engagement related to price transparency, accurate estimates, and longer term, the development of your population health strategy. Yeah, thank you, Greg and Tara, for setting the stage on that. And that's going to translate nicely in today's, into today's topic. Uh, and with that, we'd like to get an idea from the audience of um, kind of where everyone is with this mandate. So in less than two weeks now, we'll be posting our charge files up on our websites. But we want to get a sense from the audience, um, are you thinking about post 1-1 one, one, and what that date is going to mean. Uh, so let's go ahead and pull the audience here. Um, so the question here is, what are your readiness plans uh, for post 1-1 one, one price transparency? Uh, 
And then the options here are, uh, we have resources assigned to monitor competitors and download and analyze the files for pricing. Uh, we do not have a defined plan currently. Uh, we have a vendor that will provide this information and insight or not applicable. So if you could go ahead and vote what is most relevant to your current situation at your hospital, and then we'll go ahead and share the results with everyone. And it looks like half the audience has voted, so we'll give everybody about 10 more seconds here to get their votes in. All right, let's go ahead and share those results. Thank you, everybody that voted. So we can see it's pretty split evenly. So 38% said that they do have resources assigned to monitor competitors uh, and download and analyze files for pricing, uh, which we're gonna get more into uh, as the session goes on today. Um, about the same amount, 42% do not currently have a defined plan. 12% uh, have a vendor in place that's gonna provide this information and in, in insight. And then 8% said not applicable to them. So thank you everyone for voting and we'll go ahead and continue uh, with Tara. Okay. Well, in today's session, we'll focus on several key topics that will help drive success with price transparency in 2021. First, we'll review the baseline price transparency requirements with a focus on the standard charge or machine readable file We'll only take about five or six minutes for this since most people should be ready by now. Second, we'll review ways to effectively leverage this data and key analytics that you should have to navigate the new world of price transparency. And wrap up today's discussion with a few analytical concepts as we move forward and work through the need to balance price transparency with maintaining net revenue. In other words, your offensive and defensive plans for payer engagement. Yeah, thanks, Tara. So uh, in October, um, CMS did publish an updated website uh, with the following support documentation uh, for price transparency. And if you've not been to this particular website, uh, you can go and find uh, several documents, including uh, a helpful tips document, uh, an FAQ, and some other resources. There, there really wasn't anything significantly new, but there was uh, some helpful reference material if you're one of those that are still kind of in the process of gearing up for uh, posting your file. Uh, the second piece of information that we wanted to share was a recorded session that the recent Medicare Learning Network uh, team had put on. Uh, if you were unable to attend that particular uh, session, it will be posted. Uh, they had indicated within two weeks of the eight, so certainly by uh, Christmas that should be up. And in this particular session, uh, the presenter uh, did cover uh, several poll questions that were presented as true-false uh, questions. And based upon the, the low number of correct responses, we thought it would be very useful to do a quick review of those particular questions. Yes, Greg. Um with with a couple week with the mandate being a couple weeks away, I just really thought most organizations had a handle on the regs, but that wasn't the case. So um, the first one, uh, the first poll question was: Each item service provided by the hospital must have all five types of corresponding standard charges. True or false? And 69% answered true. The answer is false. The requirement is that a hospital post the standard charge as applicable for each item service the hospital provides. The next true false statement was all hospital items and services are found in the hospital charge master. And the answer is false, but 41% responded incorrectly. Another poll question that the majority of attendees answered incorrectly is, if my hospital chooses to use a price estimator tool as an alternative to meeting the requirements for making public the standard charges for shoppable services in a consumer-friendly manner, 
the price estimator tool must meet all the same requirements for posting the standard charges for shoppable services, including the requirement that no personal identifying information may be requested, such as patient insurance information. The correct answer is false because CMS did not include a requirement that no PHI be collected because we recognize that insurance or other information may be necessary to provide patients with that real-time personalized out-of-pocket price estimate. And the last true false statement was hospitals may apply for a hardship waiver exception to meeting the hospital price transparency requirements. And I couldn't believe it, but 34% uh, thought that they could apply for some type of waiver. Yeah, thank, thanks for walking through those, Tara. Um, I, I attended the MLN session, and like you, was surprised that um, uh, the response rate was what it was. Um, I think it's helpful as a reminder, would definitely encourage everyone to, to go back and, and listen to that recorded session and even go back and pull the FAQ document and some of the helpful help, helpful tip uh, documents that CMS has posted, uh, just to be sure that you're familiar with the, the regs and the new requirements. So with Tara noted, um, our focus today is really gonna be leveraging the data that will be out with the new comprehensive machine readable file, uh, sometimes referred to as the standard charge file. Uh, the shoppable, uh, file or the, the estimation tool is really oriented towards the patient as the consumer of data. Um, for the machine readable file, uh, the standard charge file, hospitals and payers are likely going to be the primary user of this information. And this is uh, really where published data will be easily compared. Um, and I think that's one piece that we're all going to be looking to download after the first. So it's just a quick review with this particular comprehensive file. There should be um, in each hospital's file uh, five components. There is a gross charge component that really reflects what's in your CDM uh, for all inpatient and outpatient services where you have a negotiated price. Um, the service package um, is going to be something that's not in your CDM and that's really an aggregation of all items and services where you have defined per the payer contract um, a service and a corresponding rate. An example there that CMS used for inpatient services is to where hospitals have a negotiated charge, if you will, associated with a DRG. So um, it, it's important to remember that with your gross charges, it is for both all items and services, which really leads to um, probably the most contentious item for, for our industry-wise, the requirement to publish the payer-specific negotiated charge. Uh, and again, that's going to be payer-specific uh, for all payers and plans. Uh, they also are requiring the discounted cash price, uh, as well as the de-identified min and max charge, listing the highest and lowest negotiated uh, charge or gross charge for each item of service. So uh, just keep in mind that the charge file uh, that's posted out there today um, typically has a CDM description in the charge value. As I mentioned a moment ago, this concept of service packages is probably going to be the, the real challenge because our industry has typically operated around revenue cycle processes that are based upon us billing charges, kind of rolling up, if you will, aggregating into uh, listing and including grouping uh, to a DRG code, a CPT code, a revenue code, et cetera. We used our contract management systems to calculate that allowable, as Tara noted, in the revenue maturity matrix. Um, everybody should be auditing back to your payer reimbursement. Um, but that process, uh, really how you're doing that calculation, should be your foundation for listing those uh, negotiated charge values. So the, the detail or line level charge, it's easy to comprehend. That service package is going to be a little bit more challenging, I think, for, for some. There will probably be some tweaks and adjustments with hospital files as we go forward. But we also have to remember it's really one of the most critical pieces with your prospective contract modeling approach and your payer strategies that we're going to do a little deeper dive into in a couple of minutes. So 
as a quick baseline review, let's look at an example file layout and let's start with the CDM tab. Um, obviously, in the, the new file layout, we have to include the CPT and the NDC codes. Um, this will make it easy for side-by-side, line-level comparisons across organizations as you download those files. You should be able to analyze the gross charge as well as the cash price and really any uh, straight discount contractual rates uh, that are going to be posted and tied to your CDM file. And as we know, for years, um, hospitals have really leaned on uh, Medicare data for this type of price comparison. Uh, really, in that, that CMS data was a terrific resource, with the exception of deliveries, pediatrics, services that just didn't map to a standard code. This new standard charge file uh, really requires a charge description. Uh, so with a little digging, you should be able to fill in some of the gaps that you previously had with your existing uh, processes with price analysis. So uh, do keep that in mind. As I mentioned, the, the service level, the service package and the negotiated charge are quite often going to be listed in separate tabs within that single uh, machine readable standard charge file. Uh, CMS is requiring that you list your base rates along with that specific payer charge uh, for all negotiated uh, service packages. For inpatient, that's probably going to be by MSDRG. On the outpatient side, it will be by APC or CPT codes. So again, it should be a fairly easy comparison within uh, like uh, payers and like plans to, to do some side-by-side -side analysis. So now that Greg's highlighted the available comparative data, let's move the discussion to how to best leverage this data for improved data analytics. Over the past several years, there have been two consistent noted concerns. One, this public list of data is going to increase the cost of healthcare, and two, this data is going to be used by the hospitals to actually increase the cost of healthcare services. But the underlying concern is really payers using this data to negotiate lower reimbursement. Hospitals have to begin rethinking how this data is going to be used with your payer engagement. It's the same game, just like any other game. We have to think about our offensive and defensive strategies simultaneously. Yeah, you're, you're right, Tara. Um, and sort of using that gross charge piece as our, our starting point here, um, you know, this data has been available for years and years as, as we've aggregated uh, data and looked at how our charges compare and uh, taking a data set from two quarters uh, earlier this year, uh, we can see that some hospitals align high or low relative to their, their market basket and their market group. Uh, one hospital is you know 100 plus percent above the market. Another hospital is um, you know anywhere from a few percentage points to 18 percent below that market group. Really, we know from experience, uh, many hospitals and strategic pricing firms have used this type of historical charge data for really benchmarking and establishing pricing guardrails. And charges, as we know, really kind of create, if you will, the retail price for a service with payers negotiating uh, discounts from charges. And this data was often used to, to really analyze by service line or code and in this particular inpatient example, we had DRG codes rolled up to service categories. And while this type of gross charge analysis did provide some insight, um, really as it relates to the, the service intensity, um, is real, as well as utilization uh, being tracked or measured by length of stay, the gross charge data uh, has also historically been used to provide us insight with charge and resource utilization. And in the example here, we, we can see how as charges are rolled up, if you will, to revenue code categories, uh, in this particular case uh, report example, it's for medicine cases with those four hospitals making and uh, representing a, a market uh, group or a market area. So we can see that if we're looking at uh, lowering charges, uh, in a linear comparison of just the CDM unit price, uh, 
uh, when, when we were looking at that detail charge file uh, on the soon to be posted files that are going to be out there, it's not really going to provide us with a true picture of how charges are used and how prices compare within a service group. We're really going to have to use both that, that detailed information as well as the role of examples. That's right, Greg. There's still going to be that need for benchmarking gross charges. But this is going to be the holy grail we've waited on forever, the payer-specific negotiated rates for my competitors. So at a high level, you want to know, are my negotiated rates high or low compared to others in the market? Then, of course, you'll want to answer that question for each contract and a little bit of insight on your volumes to put the data in perspective. Yeah, I, I agree, Tara. This is going to be um, extremely insightful for, I think, all hospitals. Um, some of our clients have noted that they have previously used blinded negotiated rate data points, um, and, and now the curtain's really going to be pulled back to, to see and understand and begin to analyze that negotiated charge data. And there are going to be different ways uh, presenting the information, similar to the, the three different formats that we've, we've laid out here in this particular ex example. Um, we have seen other clients who believe they have lower negotiated rates with their payer in their particular market, and, and they've noted their hope, uh, their plan, if you will, is to use this type of data to approach the payers um, in that offensive strategy that you mentioned a moment ago, and to really begin trying to close the reimbursement gap that they believe is out there. Um, their plan is to really use this type of linear comparison, if you will, to understand the rate difference at the CPT code level or the DRG code level. And, and most of our clients have indicated that their plan is to really download the data files and start to run queries against the data. And the key thought is to see uh, the data analysis really at both that detail level as well as the roll-up analysis to service lines and how hospitals compare overall by payer and by plan. Absolutely, Greg. And uh, another client uh, recently shared their plans to leverage the data to expand services by knowing the contractual rates at other regional hospitals. So as an example, they're looking to open several new urgent care centers and a negotiated charge file from hospitals that have been um, established services is going to be super insightful for them, similarly with complex services like chemo or, or cardiac. A, a big piece that's missing with the data that will be posted is market share or volumes. Uh, scraping the websites can show you some very favorable rates, but you'll need to keep in mind that volumes won't be posted with this data. So you may see a great rate for a service at an organization that does a few cases, and that service will likely have a very different rate from another organization that has high volume. So just something to keep in mind as well. Yeah, uh, you're, you're right, Tara. Um, and, and you and I have discussed the, the valuable insight that this type of data uh, will bring to the payer negotiation and the strategy process mm -hmm. for a number of years. Uh, we, we won't say how many years we've been working together. We'll, we'll just say that it's been a number. Um, but as a, as a level set, I, I think it's important to also kind of revisit, if you will, uh, payer scorecards and payer analysis. And, and hospitals going into the new year really need to ensure you've got clear, concise roll-up reporting of payer activity and performance. Uh, th this includes both payer-to-payer -payer comparisons and within specific payer contracts, really a comparison of the various plans that you may have uh, negotiated with that organization. In other words, your HMO, your PPO, the blue plan, the green plan, the Medicare Advantage plan. Uh, you'll need to, to look at it both within a payer organization and then comparing it to other payers uh, that, are, that are like kind organizations. We'll still need to assess volume and payment accuracy so I think it's going to be important, you know, from that contract governance standpoint, so that when underpayments occur, we'll need to know where uh, additional revenue recovery opportunities exist and how completely are our payers paying. But our payer scorecards are going to need to integrate the patient 
underpayment obligation along with denials and contractual variances as we go forward. Um, obviously, with payer, with patients becoming the third largest payer behind Medicare and Medicaid, uh, most organizations will really need to understand those payment trends. I think this will become more relevant when we start thinking through the fact that we've got to post now our cash price. Um, so when we're negotiating our um, allowable, um, we're going to have to really understand, um, is the patient paying? Uh, what portion of the patient responsibility are we collecting and are they responsible for? And we have to think through if patients are going to be going online and doing through the shoppable estimation tools a comparison of if I file this through my insurance company, what's my patient responsibility going to be as compared to if I just do this as a cash price and don't file through my insurance, what's my out-of-pocket going to be? So we're going to have to think through how we incorporate these things, both payer scorecard and patient scorecard, on a go-forward basis and, and really use that as a leverage point in our negotiation. It's also important to consistently evaluate your payer results to your initial contract model. We, we can't just model out um, our contract and assume the payer is going to, to see results as we expected in this upper left hand, or excuse me, right hand corner um, in, in the, the lower report, it shows kind of a linear graph of how the contract is actually performing. It's important to note that payers, as we go forward, are gonna be putting together similar scorecards. Uh, they're gonna want to know how you stack up uh, to your competitors using uh, their rates compared to uh, what they've negotiated or seen with other payers. So you're going to have to, to, again, think through and begin incorporating your offensive strategy with how do you stack up your payers and model out before you begin negotiations. And you're also going to have to think from a defensive standpoint how you need to really anticipate the payers using this data uh, against you as you sit down at the table. So the comparative uh, analysis of, of gross charges and that new standard charge file, along with payer scorecards, are certainly going to be insightful as we go into 2021. But we have to remember that, that that type of reporting or analysis is really just more of a static assessment, uh, if you will. And really, with our remaining time uh, today, we want to move the discussion to, to really wrap up, to begin looking at uh, leveraging dynamic uh, calculations or what if calculations, if you will, to really drive financial performance and financial improvement with your contract negotiation process. Right, Greg. So let's let's take the negotiation strategy a few steps forward. What if you can insert your competitors' rates into your claims to understand your estimated revenues using your competitors' reimbursement rates? So say we'd gain X million if we move to my top competitor's Aetna rates, or probably more realistic, we'd lose X million if Cigna moves our reimbursement more in line with another in the market. Scary, I know, but if this data is gonna be out there and payers are gonna be using it, it'll be to your advantage to understand and play on the offense. Yeah, it, it's a great point and a great visual, um, Tara, and, and I think this is the biggest hesitation and the biggest concern for most of us in the industry. Um, as noted in this particular graph, we can see that the hospital uh, with, with the highest bar uh, is that hospital with their current rates with that particular payer organization. Uh, when they inserted uh, and remodeled competitor A, competitor B, competitor C, they saw a decrease, if you will, because their rates, they were able to validate their rates were the highest uh, they were out there. Um, that's the biggest concern. Uh, payers are going to have tools to do this type of modeling, um, in some cases way before our hospital clients will have it, and they're gonna look to use this data to drive reimbursement down, even though, Price transparency has been laid out as 
potentially a means to uh, increase cost of health care. I think the bigger concern and, and more likely will be those hospitals that aren't able to uh, defensively and offensively plan and anticipate this are going to be faced with a bigger challenge of seeing their reimbursement actually lower. Mm -hmm. And we just talked about using your competitor's rates combined with your claim data, but now let's think about using your competitor's charges with your current contracts. So what impact would that have on your lesser charges and outlier hits? Would you see a significant decline in your lesser of hits and in turn see a revenue improvement? Until these terms get negotiated out of your contracts, you're still gonna to need to continue to monitor and analyze ways to keep this language from chipping away at your, at your bottom line. Yeah, another great example in visual tariff. Um, I know going forward, uh, modeling both the competitors' negotiated rates um, through the claim history and modeling their uh, charges through the claim his, uh, history is really going to provide insight with how adjustments to those two pieces will have an impact and, and will either drive financial performance up or down uh, going forward. Yep, and you know, next year there's going to be a lot of data out there. So how are you going to know where to get started in terms of using it with your negotiation? Um, so depending on your organization's goals, you may want to analyze it with a focus on margin or revenue. You want to identify your top leverage points to utilize during your negotiation, um, knowing what services or even codes you should prioritize to increase revenue is going to make for a more successful negotiation. And depending on your needs, you want to understand the various contract models when optimizing for net revenue, price transparency, or profit margin. Payers will have greater insight and data to leverage against your price position. You'll need the ability to run complex modeling to understand the impact of moving your charges um, and or signing new agreements with your payers for different reimbursement rates. Um, Excel spreadsheet models um, is what a lot of people are using today and it offers immediate updated modeling results to minor rate changes and it, you have the comfort of using the tools you're you're familiar with and have used for years but modeling is going to have to evolve absolutely tara um you know i, I think hospitals uh will, will need to understand the broader financial impact of various models and whether they're looking you know, from a goal standpoint to optimize net revenue, uh, optimize price transparency or optimize margin. Um, hospital strategies are really gonna have to switch uh, with the benefit of having this new data. Uh, we're gonna have to really uh, look towards um, having those offensive strategies to proactively push for more reimbursement, especially knowing in some cases, payers only have so much money to work with each year. So uh, if, if you want to take advantage of the situation, it's likely going to be the sooner you get out and uh, begin approaching the right payers, uh, the better off you're going to be. Because once you know the, the payers have some room to negotiate uh, earlier um, in the season, if you will, than they will later in the season. So uh, we're going to have to leverage this data sooner rather than later uh, for those that really want to take more of an offensive mindset, if you will. We also need to have a defensive mindset for those hospitals, similar to that example, uh, the visual report example we saw a moment ago, where if you think your uh, base rate reimbursement is higher, uh, you're going to want to be prepared to respond to payers that are going to quickly leverage this data and use this information against you. So um, you're going to have to think about sort of what's the best way to optimize these models on a go forward basis. Yeah, and if I could just uh, just pause there real quick, I don't mean to interrupt you guys, uh, but I do want to make one final reminder for the uh, in session offer that many of you received. Uh, you should see your chat bubble light up. Um, so if you haven't checked that, go ahead and, and check that for us uh, and, and respond if it's something that, that you might be interested in taking a look at. 
sorry about that, Greg and Tara. I'll turn it back over to you. Just wanted to make sure I made that announcement. Yeah, great point, Brad. Sure. So when the curtain comes up and the payers can see all the other payers' reimbursement rates, they're going to want to use it to tip the scale in their favor. They have the resources to analyze this data, so it'll be up to you to make sure you can come to the discussion armed with the data as well. So uh, while some organizations are dreading negotiating now that the payers have more information, we did hear from an organization earlier this week that actually wants to be one of the first. They feel that payers you know, have a budget and if um, they can push hard enough, they may be able to get um, more money. And if they um, don't negotiate until later in the year, the budget may not be there. So I guess they believe the old philosophy, the early bird gets the worm. Yeah, great, great analogy, Tara. I think some would consider payers to be a little wormy at times, uh, especially as we uh, deal with them from a negotiation standpoint. I, I think we, we have a lot of win-win scenarios out there, but with this new data that's going to be available, as we tried to, to touch on here today, uh, you're going to have to have those specific tactical and strategic steps to not just be compliant on January 1st, but really get a jump on planning for financial improvement uh, here coming up in 2021. To really win going forward with price transparency, uh, you are going to have to adapt. You're going to have to be strategic. Uh, we, we say it all the time. You have to have a plan uh, that you work. You have to be willing to update the plan as you go forward. And, and this is going to be one of those times where we're going to be updating our plans uh, because there's new data that's going to be available. So. It's not just going to be enough to meet the mandate uh, by creating these uh, two outline files, the standard charge file and however you're approaching the shoppable, whether it be a file or an estimation tool. Um, your organization is really going to need to manage that process uh, going forward with capturing the new market data uh, to really improve your pricing and reimbursement position. Um, obviously, as a group, uh, we work in the field of revenue cycle and integrity. Uh, it's going to be critical for us as an organization to help our clients really uh, best evaluate, integrate, and leverage this new data. Um, we certainly do thank everyone for their time uh, today. Good luck after the first uh, and much success in 2021. Obviously, have fun uh, the first week of January downloading your competitor files. Uh, those negotiated rates and, and finally getting on, uh, getting your hands around data that you've, you've probably been curious about for years. So um, Merry Christmas, Happy Holiday, and uh, wish everyone the best uh, for the new year. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Tara, for all the insight today. Um, if you guys have a minute, I'd like to stay on and answer a couple questions that we had come in through the session. Um, the first one, uh, the first question came through when I believe we were talking about gross charges, and this sounds more like a, a clarifying question. Um, so the question was, is the, dis is the discounted cash price equivalent to your uninsured discount price, or is it truly a cash discount price? Um, I interpret the CMS guidance on this to mean if you offer a cash discount, then it should be populated here. Uh, that, that's correct. It, it should be what you're offering up as a cash price. Um, and CMS uh, clarified in, in one of the documents that it's the, the total anticipated cash price, not just the cash price that you would be collecting at time of service, but really what that patient obligation would be uh, if they were to, to pay you directly out of pocket, if you will. Got Good it. Question. Yeah, I think that I think that clarifies it. Um, another question that came through, if we could speak a little bit, um, Greg, you it was either maybe it was Tara that, that talked about the revenue maturity matrix. But if you could speak to that a little bit more and kind of talk about the importance of the integration with with all the topics that we walked through today, if you could just speak a little bit to the importance of that. Um, of that revenue maturity matrix and and the importance of an integrated platform when we're looking at all these different variables today. 
yeah, so I'll, I'll uh, address it first, and then Terry, you can add. Um, the part that, and if you go through and read kind of the, the price transparency uh, guidelines and really where our industry's being motivated to move, um, you know, contract governance really has to uh, be tied to your ability to understand what your your net revenue is going to be when you bill and, and provide a service. And to understand that, you really have to incorporate uh, several different pieces not just uh, a, a reimbursement calculation, but, but you have to understand the integrated dynamics of how your negotiations will drive your revenue in the coming year. So you have to take into account your utilization, the market price, and the market price being both the charge as well as that negotiated rate uh, through your service mix and then taking into account as you look to lower charges, because it, for a lot of us, our charges have gotten out of whack over the years as we just raise charges to, to try to drive and, and cost shift. Uh, we're gonna have to be looking at potentially lowering charges. So how do we model that change uh, back through the payer contracts? And we have to be able to provide, even though it's not a mandate requirement, you have to be able to provide to consumers accurate estimates. So it's, it's all got to tie back to that reimbursement calculation. So when we use that expression, the, the revenue maturity matrix and, and sort of that uh, path forward, if you will, we see that true integrated need for an expected reimbursement calculation that, um, that drives kind of post-claim the results, but also provides a lot of strategic insight as you're setting charges and negotiating uh, discounts of those off of those charges on a go forward basis. So, anything you would add, Tara, uh, to that? Um, yeah, I would just say that so often you have someone working on the CDM price changes um, completely separately from managed care, and they talk, but they talk as in, "Hey, these are the areas I'm going to try and target." And it's just a broad statement. They're not passing that information back and forth. So being able to do that is just really key. It's a game changer. And um, we were able to do that. And we saw the benefits once we started passing that data back and forth. Um, you can really get a lot further. You can accomplish your goals a lot easier if you're doing them simultaneously. Gotcha. Thank you for, for expanding on that topic. I think that was helpful. Uh, well, I don't see any further questions. I'll give it another couple of seconds here if anybody has any last minute questions or thoughts. Um, otherwise, we'll we'll wrap up. This is our, our last session of 2020. We will definitely be back uh, with more to talk about, I'm sure, in early 2021 um, as we start to see some of this unfold. Um, so please be on the lookout for, for follow-up sessions. Uh, Greg, Tara, thank you for uh, sharing your insight today. Any closing thoughts you'd like to, to leave with? Yeah, Brad, uh, just two quick things. Uh, as you can see on the screen, uh, there's our email address. Uh, obviously, uh, th this is all going to be new. Uh, some of the participants on today's call are current clients. Some of you may be uh, familiar with PMMC, but we may not be working with you on this particular area. Uh, as you're starting to download the files, beginning to look at information, as you come across questions, feel free to uh, email any one of the, the three of us direct with any questions that you've got. Uh, we obviously want to be there and available as a resource as we go forward. So th this is all new. Uh, we, we're trying to present uh, some things for our clients to think about as well as the industry as a whole. So uh, we, we definitely want to continue to be there as a resource uh, regardless of whether we're working with you or not. And happy holidays, everyone. I hope you stay safe. Thanks, everyone. And I did have one final question that I just wanted to answer quickly. Uh, will the slides and recording be available? Uh, from today's session. Yes, they will. We did record today's session. Uh, so we will be sending out uh, both a copy of the slides and the recording. Uh, you should see that in your inbox 
uh, by end of day tomorrow. So thank you again, everyone, for attending. Happy holidays and happy new year. Merry Christmas, happy new year, happy holidays.